What's up, guys? I hope this podcast finds you all doing very well. For those of you who might be new to the podcast or the YouTube channel, my name is Gray Phelps, and I'm an emergency medicine physician assistant. I just recently partnered with the founder of PA Boards, Andrew Reed, and we're extremely excited to bring you guys free content via the YouTube and the podcast each week. So if you haven't subscribed already, go ahead and do that now. Today's topic is going to be about compartment syndrome. We're going to talk about how these patients are going to present, what risk factors predispose them, the physical exam, and how do we treat these patients. Compartment syndrome can be defined by any condition that causes an increased pressure within the compartment, cutting off the circulation and compromising the function of tissues within that space. It can also occur in any anatomic compartment bound by fascial membranes. The lower leg is going to be the most common site and is comprised of four compartments. You have the anterior compartment, the superficial posterior compartment, the deep posterior compartment, and the lateral compartments. Within the anterior compartment, you have the anterior tibial artery and the peroneal nerve. In addition, within the deep posterior compartment, you have the peroneal and posterior tibial artery as well as the tibial nerve. So you can start to imagine how increased pressures in these regions can cause compression to vital arteries and nerves. Guys, this is truly a diagnosis you cannot miss. So listen closely because failure to identify this diagnosis or even delays in the diagnosis can result in muscle contracture, sensory deficits, paralysis, infection, and even limb amputation. Acute compartment syndrome can occur from numerous different etologies, but it can be broken down simply into three categories, trauma with a fracture, trauma without a fracture, and non-traumatic causes. Acute compartment syndrome most often occurs 75% of the time after long bone fractures, and risk increases significantly with comminuted fractures. So we are talking about fractures to the tibia, fibula, radius, ulna, humerus, and femur. In addition, it's important to note that tibial fractures are going to lead to compartment syndrome most frequently and then forearm fractures. Other forms of trauma predisposing the patient to compartment syndrome include crush injuries, severe full thickness burns, gunshot wounds, injury to vascular structures, venous injury possibly from a traumatic deep vein harvest, and rarely secondary to ankle sprains or minor trauma to the upper extremities like being struck by a basketball very hard. Non-traumatic cases occur less frequently, but include intramuscular hemorrhage in patients on chronic anticoagulation therapy, nephrotic syndrome, or other conditions that decrease serum osmolarity. Extravasation of IV fluids, for example, maybe you put in an intraosseous line in the tibia and it comes loose and large amounts of normal saline are being infused directly into the tissue. Prolonged limb compression, possibly due to poor positioning during a long surgery, or maybe even in the unconscious, severely intoxicated patient, or from chronic exertional compartment syndrome, typically seen in young athletes who run extensively. So now we know what risk factors predispose the patient to compartment syndrome, but how are these patients going to present? Classically, these patients are going to present with pain out of proportion to their injury, persistent deep ache or burning pain, paresthesias usually within 30 to 120 minutes of acute compartment syndrome, and it can be a sign of ischemic nerve dysfunction. On a physical exam, these patients will present on your boards with the classical findings of arterial insufficiency. You can remember these by the five P's. That's pain, pallor, pulselessness, paresthesias, and paralysis. However, clinically, only pain out of proportion on exam and paresthesias is commonly associated with compartment syndrome. Paralysis is going to be a late finding and is not common, and pallor from vascular insufficiency is not common as well. In addition, arterial pulses and normal capillary refill can persist despite prolonged severe compartment syndrome, so you should not doubt your diagnosis of compartment syndrome based on the presence of pulses and preserved capillary refill on exam. Other examination findings suggestive of compartment syndrome include a tense extremity of question to palpation with a firm wood-like feeling pain with passive stretch of the muscles within the compartment, which can be an early finding, diminished sensation, and muscle weakness, which usually occurs two to four hours after compartment syndrome. So now that we know how these patients will present and what risk factors predispose them, let's talk about how we manage these patients. So in the patient with an acute tibial fracture who presents with acute onset pain out of proportion to his injury, numbness and tingling, diminished pulses, and muscle weakness, Compartment syndrome can be diagnosed clinically, and you need to get your vascular surgeon or orthopedic surgeon on the phone immediately so he can come evaluate the patient and take him to surgery for an emergent fasciotomy. In addition, make sure to relieve all external pressure to the extremity in question. Any splint, cast, or other restrictive coverings need to be removed. You will also want to make sure that the limb is not elevated or hung over the bed. Place the limb level with the heart to avoid any reductions in arterial inflow 
or increases in compartment pressures from the dependent swelling. Also, make sure you are adequately treating their pain and correcting any hypotension which could reduce tissue perfusion. But what do you do in the patient who you believe could have compartment syndrome but you are uncertain clinically? Well, in these patients, you want to give your vascular surgeon or orthopedic surgeon a call as well. Have them come evaluate the patient and if necessary, they can obtain compartment pressures for a definitive diagnosis. So that's everything we're going to cover today. If you have any questions or ideas on how I can continue to make this YouTube or podcast better, please email me at gray at physicianassistantboards.com. That's G-R-A-Y at physicianassistantboards.com. Until next time.